I paint self-portraits, Frida Kahlo once said. Because I am the person I know best, I paint my own reality. The only thing I know is that I paint because I need to, and I paint whatever passes through my head without any other consideration. Frida Kahlo produced some 70 self-portraits, tense, vibrant works that chart not only the changes in her face and feelings, but also the events in her life. Love, loss, politics, surgery, and most often her abiding passion for her husband, the great Mexican muralist Diego Rivera. What passed through Frida's head was some of the most original and dramatic imagery of the 20th century. Perhaps Frida's most astonishing self-portrait is My Birth, in which she portrayed herself emerging from her mother's womb. It is, as she put it, how I imagined I was born. As in all her self-portraits, a single eyebrow across her forehead identifies the infant as Frida. Above her mother's bed is an icon, the Virgin of Sorrows, pierced by swords, bleeding and weeping. Just the kind of imagery that Frida's devoutly Catholic mother cherished. Rivera recognized the courage behind Frida's images. He said, Frida is the only example in the history of art of an artist who tore open her chest and heart to reveal the biological truth of her feelings. The only woman who has expressed in her work an art of the feelings, functions, and creative power of woman. The 1937 self-portrait, My Nurse and I, is a declaration of faith in the continuity of Mexican culture. Frida, as an adult artist, continues to be nourished by her Indian roots. She wrote of the painting, I appear with the face of an adult woman and the body of a baby girl in the arms of my nana. From her nipples falls milk as from the sky. I came out looking like such a little girl and she so strong and so saturated with providence that it made me long to sleep. The nurse's Teotihuacan funerary mask evokes the ritual savagery of the Mexican past. And Frida appears to be at once protected by the nurse and offered as a sacrificial victim, hardly the image of a cuddled, satisfied infant. She imbibes, along with the milk, a terrible knowledge of her own fate. In a diary that Frida kept during the last 10 years of her life, Frida recalled her origins. In Coyoacan, my first cell was hatched. It was incubated in the womb of my mother, Matilda Calderon from Oaxaca. Frida portrayed herself at the age of two together with her forebears and her birthplace in My Grandparents, My Parents and I, painted in 1936. Standing naked and self-possessed in the patio of her home, Frida holds a crimson ribbon. It connects Frida to her parents and to her two sets of grandparents, her maternal grandparents of Mexican origin and her paternal grandparents of German origin. The portrait of Frida's parents was taken from their wedding photograph. Frida once said of herself, I have my father's eyes and my mother's body. Her mother was a beautiful, intelligent woman, but Frida rebelled against her conventions and her Catholicism. Her father was her favorite, and she identified closely with him. He was a well-educated, silent, sardonic atheist, and he had a special tenderness for Frida. Frida is the most intelligent of my daughters, he would say. She is the most like me. The son of Hungarian Jews who had migrated to Germany, Kahlo emigrated to Mexico in 1891 when he was 19. In 1952, 11 years after her father's death, Frida painted his portrait. 
basing the likeness on a photograph that he took of himself. His brow is furrowed, his eyes are large and shining, like the eye of his camera beside him. I painted my father, Wilhelm Kahlo, of Hungarian-German origin, artist, photographer by profession, intelligent and fine. Valiant because he suffered for 60 years with epilepsy, but he never stopped working and he fought against Hitler. With adoration, his daughter, Frida Kahlo. The story of Frida Kahlo's life begins and ends in the same place. From the outside, the building looks very much like the other houses in an old residential section of Mexico City called Coyoacan, except that its blue walls are more dazzling and the words Museo Frida Kahlo are inscribed over the portal. The entrance is guarded by two gesticulating giants. These paper mache Hudas figures are exploded on the day before Easter, a ritualistic purging of the memory of Judas who betrayed Jesus. Passing them, one enters the garden with tropical plants. Frida and Diego lived here, 1929 to 1954. In the garden is a pyramid that Rivera built for his large collection of pre-Columbian objects. Inside, there is a collection of more than a thousand retablos, which Frida and Diego collected. These tiny tin paintings, commissioned for a small fee, are gifts of gratitude for a miracle that has been performed. They depict a near escape from disaster, together with the holy agents, usually the Virgin or Christ. One day, when Frida was 18, she was taking a bus home. A trolley approached the bus and kept on coming, as if it had no brakes. Frida recalled, the train smashed the bus against the corner. It was a strange collision. It was not violent, but rather silent, slow, and it harmed everybody, but me most of all. Frida's body was almost destroyed in the accident. Her spinal column was broken in three places. She had a triple fracture of the pelvis from the steel handrail that had literally skewered her body, entering her hip 
and coming out through the vagina. The doctors did not expect her to live. Looking at the healthy young woman in the photograph taken by her father on February 27, 1926, one can hardly believe that four and a half months earlier she had nearly died. She has carefully placed her left leg in front of the right one to hide the disparity in size. In another photograph taken the same day, Frida wears a man's three-piece suit. Even at this early age, it is apparent that clothing played an important role in Frida's self-presentation. She said, I never thought of painting until 1926, when I was in bed on account of an automobile accident. Her first subjects were those convenient to an invalid, portraits of friends and family, and of herself. The canvases are dark and gloomy in tone, stiff in drawing, and awkward in the handling of space. But they have an undercurrent of strong feeling that would grow stronger as she developed her skills. In 1928, her health improved. She painted a portrait of her sister, Christina. Here, the dark atmosphere of the first paintings is gone. It is really the difference between night and day. The year in which she painted Christina, Frida met Diego Rivera. I did not know him except by sight, but I admired him enormously. I was bold enough to call him so that he would come down from the scaffolding to see my paintings and to tell me sincerely whether or not they were worth anything. He said to me, I'm very interested in your work. Go home, paint a painting, and next Sunday I will come and see it and tell you what I think. This he did, and he said, you have talent. The relationship between Frida and Diego intensified, and it was not long before Frida appeared in one of Diego's murals called The Ballad of the Proletarian Revolution. She appears as a young revolutionary wearing a red shirt with a red star, and she hands out rifles and bayonets to the workers. The mural bears testimony to Frida's developing political awareness. Guillermo Calo did not take unkindly to Rivera as a son-in-law, but Frida's mother disapproved because Rivera was old and an atheist. Nothing would dissuade Frida, however, and when she and Rivera wed, her parents said it was like the marriage between an elephant and a dove. As with any aspect of her life that affected her deeply, Frida recorded her marriage in paint, starting with a wedding portrait painted after two years of married life. The couple's relationship is a little stiff, they face forward instead of toward each other, and their hands are only tentatively clasped as if they were new partners. Diego is portrayed as he saw himself, the great artist wielding his palette and brushes. Frida plays the role she loved best, the genius's adoring wife. She cocks her head and extends her arms in his direction. It is apparent that even in the first years of marriage, Frida knew that Diego was unpossessable. Frida once said, being the wife of Diego is the most marvelous thing in the world. I let him play matrimony with other women. Diego is not anybody's husband and never will be, but he is a great comrade. I suffered two great accidents in my life, one in which a streetcar knocked me down the other accident is Diego. In Diego Rivera, Frida found both joy and sorrow. Their marriage was a union of sacred monsters. Their love, battles, separations, political escapades, friendships with men like Trotsky, Ford, and Eisenstein were gobbled by the press and mythologized by the public. In a self-portrait from the year they got married, Frida looks like a person from a totally different world from the Frida of the first self-portrait. She wears a cheap peasanty Mexican blouse, pre-Columbian jade beads, and colonial earrings. The romantic, melancholy European princess of the first self-portrait 
has turned into an emphatically Mexican girl with a fresh, eager face. When Frida married Diego, she began to espouse his Mexicanism. She wore the regional costumes of Tijuana. She followed Rivera's lead in choosing to paint Indian children in the bright, often jarring colors so often seen in Mexican popular art or in any market square. One of Frida's most important self-portraits was painted when she was in Detroit with Diego in 1932. She is clad, uncharacteristically, in a long pink dress and lacy gloves. She stands on the border between ancient Mexico and the United States. On the Mexican side of the portrait, where Frida wanted to be, are the sun, moon, pyramids, exotic plants, and pre-Columbian idols. The United States side of the painting shows smokestacks belching smoke and windowless skyscrapers that look like tombstones. The machines have electric cords where the Mexican plants have roots. To Frida, the U.S. was ugly, dull, and drab. She once said that Detroit automobiles, anything mechanical, had always meant bad luck and pain. Another comment Frida made on life in the United States was in the painting, My Dress Hangs There. Frida's empty Tijuana costume hangs amidst the chaos of the United States and its technology. Frida became pregnant at least three times, but her pelvis, injured during the bus accident, prevented her from bringing a child to term. Each time she became pregnant, she either miscarried or was forced to have a therapeutic abortion. The most traumatic miscarriage was the one she had on July 4, 1932, in Detroit. Her life was saved, but during the 13 days of hospitalization, she wept and she said she wanted to die. She also wanted to draw the fetus the way it should have looked when she lost it. Rivera procured medical books for her. She painted her miscarriage and her brush with death on a small sheet of tin, thus emulating the Mexican retablo painters. In Henry Ford Hospital, Frida lies naked in her bed hemorrhaging onto a single sheet. Her stomach is still swollen from pregnancy. A series of objects symbolic of her emotions at the time of her miscarriage float around her bed. They are attached with loops or with ironically festive bows to the ends of red ribbons that suggest veins or umbilical cords and that she holds against her stomach. One of the objects is a male fetus, the little Diego Frida had said she hoped to have. The snail, Frida explained, refers to the slowness of the miscarriage, which, like the snail, was soft, covered, and at the same time open. At the bottom of the painting is the broken pelvis that prevented Frida from having children. The large lavender orchid looks like an extracted uterus. Diego gave it to me in the hospital, Frida said. When I painted it, I had the idea of the sexual thing mixed with the sentimental. To help combat her depression from the miscarriage, Rivera conspired to keep Frida occupied 
and she produced a lithograph called Frida and the Abortion. Me and My Doll, painted in 1937, expresses most directly Frida's frustration at not being a mother. Instead of a conventional image of a mother cooing over her infant, we see a woman sitting bolt upright. She is very much alone. My painting carried within it the message of pain. Painting completed my life. I lost three children, painting substituted for all of this. I believe that work is the best thing. Frida transferred her yearnings for a baby to other people's children. Christina's children, Isolda and Antonio, were in and out of their aunt's house as if it were their own. Frida lavished a different but equally warm attention on her numerous pets, a pack of dogs, various monkeys, cats, parrots, doves, an eagle, a deer. When monkeys and parrots accompany Frida in her self-portraits, they often seem a substitute for children. The most interesting and frequent animal companions are her monkeys, symbols of promiscuity and fertility. Sometimes Frida draws parallels between simian features and her own. Other times the monkeys seem to be part of her. Although her monkeys always seem to console her and to provide company, they actually underscore her horror at being left alone. Their physical proximity is disturbing, for their animal restlessness heightens the tension of Frida's stoic impassivity and hints at a bestial wildness hidden beneath her skin. Frida tended the plants in her garden as if they were needy infants. Flowers, fruit she painted so they looked alive, projecting onto them the full force of her obsession with fertility. She wrote, the vegetal miracle of my body's landscape is in you, the whole of nature. I traverse it in a flight that with my fingers caresses the round hills, the valleys longing for possession, and the embrace of the soft green fresh branches covers me. I penetrate the sex of the whole earth. Its heat embraces me, and in my body everything feels like the freshness of tender leaves. Its dew is the sweat of an always new lover, it is not love, nor tenderness, nor affection. It is the whole of life. Mine that I found when I saw it in your hand, in your mouth, and in your breasts. In my mouth I have the almond taste of your lips. Your words have never gone outside. Only a mountain knows the insides of another mountain. At times when your presence floats continuously, as if wrapping all my being, in an anxious wait for morning. And I notice that I am with you in this moment, still full of sensation. My hands are plunged in oranges, and my body feels surrounded by you. In Flower of Life, 1944, Frida projects her obsession with procreation into images of vegetation by transforming tropical-looking plants into male and female genitalia. Moses, 1945, expands the fertility theme to the scope of a history painting. It looks like a miniature mural similar to the frescoes that Rivera painted. The sides of the painting are crammed with gods and heroes. The center scene, Moses' birth, reveals again Frida's preoccupation with fertility, the source of which is the sun. 
At the bottom, a snail spurts fluid into a conch. An expression of her desire to partake in the flow of the universe is a painting entitled Roots, 1943. It depicts a dream of birth. Frida's body extends over a vast desert terrain. A window opens in her torso, giving birth to a pliant green vine that spreads luxuriantly across the desert floor. Frida's longing for fertility and connectedness. Though childless, she is part of the chain of life. Frida took some comfort in her faith that everything under the sun was intimately linked. Like Rivera, she saw the human body as deeply embedded in the vegetable world, rooted in the earth. In 1931, she showed her view of the cycle of life and death in Luther Burbank, a portrait of the man who developed hybrid fruits. The deceased Demas shows a child that Frida chose to paint because of her personal association of children with death. The painting is in the Mexican tradition of portraiture of the dead that stretches back to colonial times. And Demas is, according to Mexican custom, dressed up like one of the magi that came to worship the infant Jesus. Frida's preoccupation with death can be seen in the objects that she kept about her house. A painting of a dead child above one of her beds. Skeleton hudasas hanging from another bed. collection of small skeleton puppets. In her diary are sketches of dancing skeletons. In her painting, The Dream, Frida sleeps in her four-poster bed, dreaming of a time long after death when plants would sprout from her grave. She pairs herself with a skeleton in the form of a hudas, which is entwined with wires and explosives. At any moment, it could explode, making Frida's dream of death a reality. This preoccupation with death is expressed again in a painting called Thinking About Death, 1943. An opening in Frida's forehead reveals her thoughts, a skull and crossbones set in a miniature landscape. Like many Mexicans, Frida saw death as a fact of life, something to be faced head on and accepted. In Mexico, death is festive and funny. Octavio Paz observed, the word death is not pronounced in New York, in Paris, in London, because it burns the lips. The Mexican, in contrast, is familiar with death, jokes about it, caresses it, sleeps with it, celebrates it. It is one of his favorite toys and his most steadfast love. Mexicans celebrate death in a festival called the Day of the Dead. Sugar skulls are eaten. You can order one with your name on it. Tombs are decorated with yellow flowers. Meals and offerings are prepared to be shared with the dead in an overnight celebration at the cemetery. Ya todos diles que sí, pero no les digas cuánto ya sin ver y sin ti a mí. 
por eso sigo penando. The Mexican attitude towards death is best exemplified in the work of the great printmaker, Jose Guadalupe Posada, who popularized images of mocking skeletons, dancing, singing, and laughing. One of Posada's skeleton characters, the Calavera Catrina, appears in a mural that Rivera did called Dream of a Sunday Afternoon in the Central Alameda Park. The skeleton appears in the mural holding the arm of Posada on one side and Rivera's hand on the other. Posada was given a prominent position because Rivera claimed he was his chief artistic mentor. Rivera himself appears as a fat, devilish boy. Behind him is Frida, shown as a mature woman a head taller than Diego. She holds a yin-yang symbol, which represents the male-female duality which she felt underlay all life. Her right hand rests protectively on Diego's shoulder. Far from the subordinate role that Frida depicted in her marriage portrait, Rivera presents his wife in a maternal role. In 1934, Rivera had an affair with Frida's sister, Cristina. He painted Cristina in a fresco in the National Palace. Her eyes have that blank, orgasmic expression that Rivera reserved for women with whom he was sexually infatuated. When Frida learned of Diego and Cristina's betrayal, she wrote, I am in such a state of sadness, boredom, etc., that I can't even do a drawing. The situation with Diego is worse each day. Frida painted almost nothing during the period when Rivera was involved with Cristina. In 1935, she painted a few small nips in which she projected all her own agony onto another woman's calamity. The painting is based on the newspaper account of a drunken man who stabbed his girlfriend 20 times. He innocently protested, but I only gave her a few small nips. The principal source for a few small nips is the satiric graphics of Jose Guadalupe Posada, whose skeleton prints and sensational horror scenes both Frida and Diego relished. Frida painted this scene because she felt a sympathy with the murdered woman because she herself had come close to being, as she put it, murdered by life. Two years later, Frida gave testimony to the lingering impact of Diego's affair with Cristina in a painting called Memory. Frida appears with cropped hair and in European clothes. During Rivera's affair, she had cut her hair and stopped wearing Tijuana costumes as a kind of retaliation. She is flanked by her alternate identities, schoolgirl clothes and Tijuana costume, both empty but equipped with one arm. Frida is armless, suggesting her feeling of helplessness. In her chest is a gaping hole pierced by a rod. The heart, huge because it feels so much, lies on the ground at her feet a fountain pumping rivers of blood into blue water. Frida was by no means always the helpless victim of Rivera's infidelities. She engaged in affairs of her own. One of Frida's lovers was the great Russian revolutionary Leon Trotsky. Rivera had arranged for Trotsky and his wife to be given asylum in Mexico. The Trotskys lived in Frida's house for two years. Frida employed all her considerable seductive skills to attract Trotsky, and it was not long before Trotsky began writing letters and slipping them into books that he was lending to Frida. Soon the flirtation had become a full-fledged affair. 
but though Frida was fond of Trotsky and flattered to be loved by him, in the end she grew bored by his pedantic personality. Months after the affair was over, Frida gave her ex-lover a present. She presents herself to the great revolutionary as a colonial-style bourgeoise. In her hands, a sheet of paper reads, For Leon Trotsky, with all love, I dedicate this painting on the 7th of November, 1937. It was both Trotsky's birthday and the anniversary of the Russian Revolution. André Breton, Pope of the Surrealist movement, was also charmed by Frida and her work. He wrote of Frida, She is a young woman endowed with all the gifts of seduction, one accustomed to the society of men of genius. There is no art more exclusively feminine, in the sense that in order to be as seductive as possible, it is only too willing to play alternately at being absolutely pure and absolutely pernicious. The art of Frida Kahlo is a ribbon around a bomb. The admiration of men like Breton led to invitations to have exhibitions in both New York and Paris, where she met with a great deal of success and recognition from artists such as Picasso, Miro, and Tanguy. Frida's response to being welcomed into the Surrealist pantheon was a show of innocent dismay. I never knew I was a surrealist, she said, until André Breton came to Mexico and told me I was. After 1938, Frida's paintings became more complex, more penetrating, more disturbingly intense. Works like What the Water Gave Me show that her encounter with surrealism led to a deeper expression of enigma and psychological innuendo. This painting depicts a bathtub daydream in which images of apprehension and recollection, sexuality, pain, and death float in free association on the bathwater above the bather's submerged legs. They thought I was a surrealist. I never painted dreams. I painted my own reality. Frida's journal, kept during the last decade of her life, is a moving and poetic outpouring of images and words. Color bursts wildly out of outlines. Lines hurtle and meander as if she were drawing in a trance. Figures are fragmented and distorted. Faces are often grotesque masks. The starting point for many images was a drop of ink. Or sometimes Frida began a drawing by putting a spot of color on a page. And then, while the page was still wet, she closed the diary so that the spot changed shape and was doubled. Using these images as points of departure, she elaborated on them. Frida wrote, Who would say that spots live and help one live? Ink, blood, smell. I do not know what ink I would use that would want to leave its track in such form. I respect its wishes and will do what I can to flee from myself. Worlds inked worlds, land free and mine, faraway suns that call me because I form a part of their nucleus, foolishness. What would I do without the absurd and the fleeting? Frida also explores her memories in her diary. She recalls her childhood, telling the story of her imaginary friend. In 1939, Diego and Frida were divorced. For solace, Frida turned to painting. On the day the divorce papers came through, Frida had nearly finished what is her best known painting, The Two Fridas. The two Fridas sit side by side, their hands joined in a stiff clasp. The Frida on the right, the loved Frida, wears Mexican clothes. Her skin is dark, her heart is whole. In her hands, she holds a miniature portrait of Diego from which blood flows. The unloved Frida on the left wears a white Victorian dress. 
Her lace bodice is torn, exposing a broken heart. Near her sex, she holds a pair of surgical pincers, which cut off the flow of blood from Diego's portrait. In a 1940 self-portrait, Frida amplifies her personal misery by giving it Christian significance. She presents herself as a martyr with a necklace of thorns. The dead hummingbird pendant suggests Frida's own deadened spirit. The bird also has another meaning. Hummingbirds are used as magic charms to bring luck in love. In 1940, she painted self-portrait with cropped hair, in which she sits in a Mexican chair in the midst of a large expanse of reddish-brown earth that is covered with strands of her hair. She is dressed in a man's suit that is so large it must be Diego's. She sits with her legs apart like a man. A lock of hair hangs between her legs like a murdered animal. She holds a scissors near her sex. At the top of the painting are the words of a song. Look, if I loved you, it was for your hair. Now that you are bald, I don't love you anymore. However, despite difficulties, there was an abiding love between Diego and Frida. At Diego's request, Frida went to San Francisco to join him. On December 8, 1940, Frida and he were married for the second time. They returned to Mexico and began life together again. Their reconciliation settled into a comfortable, reasonably happy pattern. Frida painted in the mornings and spent much of the rest of her time finding ways to make life convenient and pleasant for Diego. Frida wrote, the remarriage functions well, a small quantity of quarrels, better mutual understanding, and on my part, less investigations of a tedious kind with respect to other women. Thus you can understand that at last I have learned that life is this way, and the rest is just an illusion. Self-portrait with braid can be seen as a comment on her remarriage. The hair strewn all over the ground in the earlier portrait has been gathered, braided, and shaped into a pretzel on top of Frida's head. A reaffirmation of the femininity that she had denied. In Self-Portrait as a Tijuana, 1943, Frida's love and longing for Diego made her deck herself in the headdress of the women of Tehuantepec with its bridal ruffles and veils. Framed with a starched white lace, her face looks perverse, a beautiful carnivorous tropical flower. White threads from the headdress intertwine with the black tendrils that spring from the veins of leaves adorning her hair. Like a female spider peering from the center of her web, Frida seems to have trapped her thoughts of her mate in the form of a miniature portrait of Diego. In 1944, a year later, Frida painted Frida and Diego, 1929-1944, as an anniversary gift for Diego. Their faces form a single head. This melding of identities is not a harmonious union. The two halves of their faces do not line up, a mismatching that creates a feeling of explosive disjunction. Frida painted another self-portrait in which she wears a Tijuana headdress in 1948. 
the contours of her face are fuller, coarser, older. Frida's despair intensifies in Diego and I, the one painting in which she comes close to letting go of her mask of impassivity. Frida is weeping, and a mass of loose hair swirls around her neck as if it were going to choke her. A small portrait of Diego rests upon Frida's eyebrows. Diego was the constant intruder into her thoughts. Frida's private feelings about her husband are revealed in her journal. I love Diego, no one else. Diego, I am alone. My Diego, I am no longer alone. You accompany me. You put me to sleep and you revive me. Diego, nothing is comparable to your hands and nothing is equal to the gold green of your eyes. My body fills itself with you for days and days. You are the mirror of the night, the violent light of lightning, the dampness of the earth. Your armpit is my refuge. My fingertips touch your blood. All my joy is to feel your life shoot forth from your fountain flower, which mine keeps in order to fill all the paths of my nerves, which belong to you. She took on a more and more motherly role in relation to him. There was much of the little boy in Diego. Frida discovered that by mothering him, she could tie him to her emotionally. In the mid-1940s, Frida's health worsened. She lost weight, had frequent fainting spells, and a fever. The pains in her foot and spine increased, and she had to wear a steel corset to support her back. The broken column was painted in 1944, soon after she had undergone surgery. Frida's resolute calm creates an almost unbearable tension, a feeling of paralysis. Anguish is made vivid by nails driven into her naked body. A gap resembling an earthquake fissure splits her torso, the two sides of which are held together by an orthopedic corset, which is a symbol of the invalid's imprisonment. Inside her torso, we see a cracked ionic column in the place of her own deteriorating spinal column. Life is thus replaced by a crumbling ruin. Another 1946 painting that records Frida's pain is The Little Deer, a self-portrait in which Frida presents herself with the body of a young stag, her human head crowned with antlers. Once again, Frida used flawed objects to refer to her bodily and psychological injuries. Massive tree trunks of dry, cracked wood with broken branches symbolize decay and death, and knots and gashes in the bark echo the wounds in the deer's flanks. Without Hope, 1945, Frida stages her drama in a vast, heaving sea of volcanic rock. Again, the faults and fissures of the land symbolize the violence done to her body. Frida lies in bed weeping, and between her lips she holds the tip of a huge membranous funnel, 
a huge cornucopia of gore containing a pig, chicken, brains, turkey, beef, sausage, and fish, expressing her horror at force feeding after surgery. The sheet that covers Frida's naked body is dotted with round microscopic organisms that look like cells with nuclei or eggs waiting to be fertilized. At the top of the cornucopia is Frida's sugar candy skull. In June 1946, after nearly nine months of being immobilized in bed, Frida went to see a prominent New York surgeon who performed a spinal fusion. When Frida returned to Mexico, she was first bedridden and then enclosed in a steel corset for eight months. Instead of improving, her health grew worse. Nevertheless, she painted. Tree of Hope, 1946 shows Frida clothed in a red Tijuana costume, sitting guard over a Frida who lies naked but partially covered with a sheet on a hospital trolley. The recumbent Frida appears to be anesthetized after an operation that has left deep bleeding incisions on her back. The seated Frida proudly holds a bright pink orthopedic corset. She is fortified by a flag she holds in her right hand, emblazoned in red with words from a Mexican song that Frida often repeated to her friends, Tree of Hope, Keep Firm. By early 1950, Frida was so sick that she had to go to a hospital in Mexico City. She was to remain there for a year, having a series of bone grafts and spinal fusions. When she felt well enough, she painted, using a special easel that allowed her to paint lying flat on her back. She worked on My Family, another version of her family tree. Painting had become an ever more important source of spiritual support, and Frida longed to get well so that she could work for longer hours. When I leave the hospital two months from now, she said after six operations, there are three things I want to do, paint, paint, paint. Frida had her friends sign their names on her various plaster casts, decorating them also with feathers, mirrors, decals, photos, and the red star and hammer and sickle. I never lost my spirit, she said. I passed three years in the hospital as if it were a fiesta. I cannot complain. It was out of gratitude to her surgeon that Frida painted self-portrait with the portrait of Dr. Ferrillo. It is a secular retablo of Frida surviving danger and Dr. Ferriel taking the place of a holy image. Frida wrote, I have been sick a year. Dr. Ferriel saved me. He gave me back the joy of life. As Frida's health deteriorated, her attachment to things, to politics, to friends, and to Diego 
grew more intense. Her allegiance to the Communist Party became a kind of religion. She wrote in her diary, the revolution is harmony of color and form and everything exists and moves beneath only one law, life. No one is more than a functioning or part of the total function. Today, as never before, I am accompanied. I am now a communist being. Viva Stalin, viva Diego. She tried to express her political commitment in her painting. In Marxism will give health to the sick, Frida, encased in an orthopedic corset, is saved by the miracle-making saint Karl Marx. Two enormous hands from the sky support Frida, allowing her to cast aside her crutches. Early in 1953, Frida's doctors began to hint that they would have to amputate her leg because of gangrene. Her diary reveals her anguish and her determination to have hope. On my whole body, there is only one, and I want two. In order to have two, they have to cut one. It is the one that I do not have that I have to have in order to be able to walk. The other will already be dead. For me, wings are more than enough. Let them cut it, and off I'll fly. Feet, what do I want them for, if I have wings to fly? They amputated my leg six months ago. They have given me centuries of torture, and at moments I almost lost my reason. I keep on wanting to kill myself. Diego is the one who holds me back because of my vanity in thinking that he would miss me. He has told me so, and I believe him. But never in my life have I suffered more. I will wait a little while. It was one of those cold, dank, rainy days when Frida left her bed in order to participate in a communist demonstration. This was her last public appearance, and Frida made a heroic spectacle. Frida knew that she was dying. She wrote in her diary, I hope the exit is joyful, and I hope never to come back. She died Tuesday, July 13, 1954. Her death was reported as a pulmonary embolism. When Frida died, Diego's usually ebullient, rotund face became haggard and gray. He became an old man in a few hours. Rivera stood by Frida with his hands clenched into fists, his face and body sunken in sorrow. In his autobiography, Rivera wrote, July 13, 1954 was the most tragic day of my life. I have lost my beloved Frida forever. Too late now, I realized that the most wonderful part of my life had been my love for Frida. Eight days before she died, when her life was darkened by deepening calamity, Frida Kahlo dipped her brush in dark red paint and inscribed her name and the date, then in large letters, Viva. La Vida. <laughs> <laughs>